It seems to me that the most terrible mistake that absolutely anyone can make is to get married for the wrong person. Of course, it's cool when you love a person and want to live your whole life with them, but these are different things. When making such an important decision, it's extremely important to listen not only to yourself, but also to those people you trust, otherwise you can make a big mistake, which I encountered myself. That night, far from home in a hotel room, I was reliving moments from the past, reminding me of scenes from a movie that is impossible to forget. Despite spending the past 15 years trying not to think about what happened, those memories suddenly surfaced in my mind with unexpected force, causing a shiver throughout my body. Only my hands remained still and firm as I held a gun just inches from her head while she peacefully slept in our bed, covered by a sheet only up to her mid-legs. This image was so vivid and real, as if it were a moment experienced from a bad book about a love triangle, where the husband comes home early and finds his wife with another man. On that fateful day, I had been away for a whole week and hadn't planned to return until free day. However, having finished work early on Thursday evening, I decided to change my plans, eager to be in Marilyn's arms as soon as possible. My first suspicion of Traubelarose when I called her at home and heard her breathless and flustered voice as if she was drunk or engaged in vigorous exercise. But what particularly alarmed me was the background sound of a baseball match. Considering Marilyn had never been interested in sports and especially hated baseball, finding it boring. I decided not to tell her about my immediate return, pretending it was just another one of my regular evening calls. Approaching the house and seeing an unfamiliar car in the driveway, I realized my wife was not alone. Everything was lit up, although it was usually dark in front of the house. I left my car on the street and quietly approached the side door, which turned out to be unlocked. Silently entering the house and taking off my shoes, I headed for the kitchen through the back room. Just opening the door, I heard sounds coming from Marilyn that left no doubt she was engaged in a sexual activity. Her moans were soft but throaty and distinctly audible, confirming my worst suspicions. I wanted to carefully look at what was going on in our bedroom, but before that I tiptoed into the room where my four-year-old daughter was sleeping. I looked at her and walked on. My fingers were clenching with such force that my palms were red from the strain. The door to our bedroom was not completely closed, so I easily opened it and saw my wife having sex with a big man. This man clearly felt dominant, because my wife was in the doggy position. She buried her face in the pillow so that her screams would not be so loud. Meanwhile, the man put one of his feet on my wife's head and continued to bring the matter to an end with frenzied force while he shouted the dirtiest words, and my wife liked it. I almost threw up from what I see. For the whole of our marriage, Marilyn did not give me any hints and reasons for jealousy. I admit that over the past year, I had a lot of unscheduled business trips. But every time I returned home, I did not see anything suspicious. Our bed life was active, even after the birth of our daughter. It was a mystery to me why Marilyn decided to take such a step. While I was standing and thinking about all this, suddenly, I caught the moment of completion. Marilyn clawed at the bed, and she finished it in a way she had never finished with me. I became seriously uneasy. I did not understand where I had given up. There were many options for my actions in my head. For example, how I could take a vase and use it to knock out my lover, and then take him to the forest. But my common sense said the opposite. You can't come into direct conflict with this man. He was bigger than me and more athletic. I didn't want one day I caught my wife cheating and got in the face at the same time. It would be humiliating for me. But I still wanted revenge, so I had one radical but very good option. I silently closed the bedroom door behind me, remaining unnoticed. My next action was to quietly leave the house, after which I returned to my car and drove away. My father, who worked in the police and had a keen interest in firearms, owned a whole arsenal, from pistols to rifles and shotguns. He taught all of us, including my older sister and younger brother, 
how to handle weapons in our teenage years. Moreover, I knew where the key to his gun safe was kept. Fortunately, my parents were relaxing somewhere in nature, by a lake, enjoying their favorite van, leaving me with the house keys so I could take care of the dog in their absence. Thus, my appearance at home late at night would not raise any suspicions. At that moment, I didn't care if anyone would question my actions as I planned to end my own life, and nothing else mattered to me anymore. I decided to use one of my father's pistols to deal with Marilyn and her lover, if he was still there, and then myself. Marilyn's betrayal destroyed my desire to live. Recalling that moment, I remember once driving to my parents' house, disabling the alarm, and entering my father's office. In the desk drawer, I found the key I was looking for, then headed to the gun cabinet. I chose a 9mm automatic pistol. Finding a full magazine, I loaded the weapon and hid it behind my belt. Leaving the house, I did not forget to activate the alarm and headed back to my place, not getting distracted by anything on the way. I have always been a person who pursued his goals, and at that moment, I was fully focused on what I had planned. Disappointment enveloped me when I noticed the absence of Marilyn's lover's car. This meant he did not plan to stay overnight. But I quickly diverted from that thought, as my anger was entirely directed at my wife. In silence, I entered the house, ready to take extreme measures against the woman I considered my beloved, ready to end my own suffering as well. But suddenly, a soft sigh came from behind. My daughter Jamie quietly asked, Daddy, why do you want to shoot Mom? Her words cut through my confusion, making me realize what I could have done in front of my daughter, what awakened her and brought her here at this decisive moment. I could only explain as divine intervention. At that same moment, Marilyn woke up and screamed, seeing me with the weapon. I let out an incoherent yell and filled with rage threw the pistol, shattering our wedding photo. This scared Jamie, and she started to cry. Tears burned my eyes, and Marilyn's pleas to stop and let her explain mixed with the ringing in my ears. I picked up my daughter, hugged her tightly, and headed for the door. She clung to me, understanding that her world could drastically change. Where are we going, Daddy? She asked between sobs. To Grandpa and Grandma's for the night, I replied, trying to hold back tears. Mom did something very bad and we can't stay here, I continued, warning that we needed to leave before something terrible happened. With those words, I burst into tears as I hadn't cried in many years. After 15 years, I returned to my hometown for a conference in my field where I have achieved significant success. Coming back to my hometown after a 15-year absence evoked mixed feelings in me. Everything seemed different after that horrific night when I almost crossed the line, becoming the cause of a tragedy. The city had grown, but my family's life had come to a halt. My father had died of lung cancer eight years ago, and my mother followed him, unable to survive the loss. My sister never found her home here, and my brother moved across the country for work. After my mother's departure, I had no reason to return, except for some moments of memory especially after one of the days of our four-day meeting. Worn out from boredom in the hotel room, I went to the hotel bar to drink a couple of bottles of beer. I had had problems with alcohol in the past, so I needed to be careful, but I felt that a couple of drinks would help me relax. As always, I chose a corner table to keep an eye on the situation in the bar, an old habit acquired after a tough breakup with Marilyn, which left a deep mark of distrust in my soul. Absorbed by my second pint of beer, I saw her. Marilyn entered the bar, and I immediately recognized her, despite the years. Living with such a charming woman had left an indelible mark on my memory, even after 15 years. I had seen her only a couple of times lately, and since we said goodbye at my mother's funeral, we hardly communicated. She looked unchanged, still slim, tall, with the same wavy red hair falling just below her shoulders. Her fiery green eyes looked at me as piercingly as ever, but something about her was different. The first thing that struck me was how she had changed in the chest area, now appearing fuller and attracting attention in her golden lace blouse. 
As she looked around, I suddenly noticed that her appearance had changed for the worse. An abundance of makeup, a short skirt, and stockings gave her a provocative look that didn't seem to suit her. It seemed that a certain tiredness was showing through her appearance, as if life had dealt her several heavy blows. When she approached the bar to get a drink without paying for it, I noticed her exchanging glances with someone familiar. It was a guy from the conference who always tried to present himself as a big ladies' man, though in reality, he seemed more like an empty braggart than a true playboy. He approached Marilyn and handed her something, apparently money. I don't know what prompted me to intervene. Perhaps it was a residual affection for Marilyn, curiosity, or a desire to show this braggart his place. In any case, I stood up and headed towards them, ready to stir up their meeting. I approached the booth that Marilyn had just vacated and leaned in toward the guy, whispering to him that it was time to leave. His gaze was full of malice, but only until it met mine. You have no right to tell me what to do, he retorted with a hint of irritation in his voice, insisting that he and Marilyn were on a date. She merely shrugged indifferently, passively watching the scene unfold. I decisively grabbed him by the neck, threatening in a quiet but angry voice that if he didn't back off within ten seconds, he would regret it. His reaction was immediate. He gasped and his eyes widened in shock before I let him go and made way. You're not worth the pain, he threw at Marilyn as a farewell and disappeared, freeing the space. I sat down opposite Marilyn, and our gazes met in torturous silence until she decided to break it. You always love to dramatize, she noted. I admitted that I had become that way because of her, and confirmed it, with a nod towards the empty glass in front of me. Despite everything, she acknowledged that I looked good, thanks to my efforts in the gym and my ambition to never play second fiddle. With pain in her voice, Marilyn confessed that I was and would remain the only man she had ever loved. My reaction was bitter, but I decided not to dwell on past grievances, apologizing for my harshness. She admitted she deserved such treatment, adding that she still loved me despite the inner demons she tried to tame when I was around. Our conversation was interrupted by an awkward silence, during which we both delved into memories until I finally asked the question that had been hanging in the air. Are you working tonight? I asked, and Marilyn smirked at me, making my suspicions about her job clear. At that moment, I remembered how I met Marilyn. It was at a New Year's party at a country house, where there was everything from ordinary beer to more forbidden substances. It was then that I slept with Marilyn, and it was the best sex of my life. At that time, I was always amazed at how an 18-year-old girl could do such things in bed. Marilyn was a real mystery to me, but nonetheless, when we started dating officially, rumors began to circulate, and they were not very pleasant. My brother Eric, who was studying in a parallel class and heard a lot about Marilyn, told me that she had slept with all the cool guys at school, that she dabbled in light forbidden substances, and generally led a destructive lifestyle. I couldn't verify any of this because I was already in college by then, and Marilyn was finishing high school. But somehow, we had a conversation during which she confessed to me that she really had many guys, but out of all of them, she loved me. And you know what? I believed her. Back when I was a student, I really did believe her, because I loved her. I also remembered how I always wondered about Marilyn's fidelity that spring when I was in college and she was still finishing high school. Without any clues or conversations on the subject, I saw no reason to doubt her. Marilyn didn't seem inclined towards college. Instead, after school, she got a job in a store in the same town where I was studying, and we moved into a rented apartment together. A year later, we got married, and after I finished my studies, I found a job in our hometown. Sometimes it seems to me that if we had chosen a different city to live in, everything could have turned out differently. But Marilyn seemed like a timer, ready to go off anywhere. Our first two years of marriage were happy until Marilyn got pregnant with Jamie, our future daughter. She was not against the idea of pregnancy 
and I had to persuade her to give up contraception and try for a child. The difficult pregnancy and hard labor increased the distance between her and Jamie from the start. Marilyn was never cold or cruel, but her attachment to her daughter was not as one would typically expect between a mother and child. So, Jamie became daddy's girl, which perhaps put a strain on my relationship with Marilyn. The situation began to deteriorate when Jamie turned three, and I was offered a promotion at work that required frequent travel. A few months later, I learned that my life with Marilyn started to unravel about eight to nine months after she reconnected with someone from her past. This old school acquaintance brought her back to a lifestyle full of extreme hobbies and dependencies, which I discovered after one particularly hard night when I found my wife in bed with another man. My response was to decide to evict Marilyn from the house, which, to my surprise, she accepted without a fight. To understand the full picture of her actions over the last six months, I turned to a private detective. The next step was my appearance in court, where I had to listen to accusations against me. The judge suggested that I seek professional help, although deep down, I knew it would change little. The humiliation I suffered in my hometown because of Marilyn was the last straw. In the end, during the divorce proceedings, I managed to win custody of our daughter Jamie, and I moved to a new job in another city, located a hundred miles away from our family home. Marilyn's visits to her daughter were brief and infrequent. Once, during one of such rare visits, she brought home her new friend, and their evening turned into indecent festivities, while her daughter remained alone in the living room. This discovery was a shock to me, and confirmed that Marilyn had behaved in a similar manner during our marriage, even before I learned of her infidelity. Following this incident, I finally decided to move to a city far from my past life and start over with a clean slate. Reflecting on those dark times, I realize how close I was to utter despair. The thought that I might have followed in Marilyn's reckless footsteps, if not for my daughter's intervention, now seems incredibly selfish. In those moments, I was so devastated that the future seemed hopeless. But eventually, I realized that the only way out was to gather the remnants of my shattered life and move forward. With these thoughts, I concluded my participation in the Congress packed my bags, and started preparing for a new stage in my journey. On the day I left my home, filled with mixed feelings after meeting with Marilyn, I keenly felt the need to meet with Katie. Her ability to comfort me in moments when emotions were swirling was invaluable. Before departure, the porter handed me a heavy paper envelope, mentioning that a lady had left it for me that morning. I decided not to rush opening it, preferring to wait for some privacy on the plane. Inside the envelope, I found a letter addressed to me, and another, tightly sealed, to Jamie. Upon opening my letter, I couldn't help but smile, recognizing Marilyn's familiar handwriting. Dear Jason, it began, your words mean a lot to me, that you don't hate me. I know I would have every right to your hatred for everything I've done. You seem to have done a wonderful job raising Jamie, which is what I expected. Deep down, I always felt unsuitable for the role of a mother, though I tried. I don't know if she remembers me, but perhaps it's for the best. Your new wife has become a real mother to her, more than I ever could be, and I have no right to interfere. Nonetheless, I wrote Jamie a letter, explaining my life and our mistakes. Please give it to her before she gets married, so she can learn from my mistakes and not repeat them. The letter left me in contemplation. Marilyn confessed her errors and expressed a desire to protect Jamie from similar mistakes, even without directly interfering in her life. It was a powerful reminder of the complexities of family relationships and how important it is to sometimes let go of the past for the sake of the future. I'm confident she will make the right choice in a life partner. I wish she would realize, if you have a real man by your side, you should value him like a king, putting his interests first. Unfortunately, I missed the chance to keep the best thing that ever happened to me. Take care and send my love to Jamie, dear Marilyn, Katie, and the guys, Bobby and Philip. I thought, as I got off the plane and met their gazes in the arrival hall.
Hall. Jimmy couldn't join because of an exam the next morning, but promised to come over the weekend. Katie Barrett was my salvation. We met when I was filling out a form for alcohol dependency treatment, which my boss had directed me to under an ultimatum, treatment or dismissal. That moment was a turning point in my descent, which began after my divorce. Katie, a tall and slim woman with a narrow waist and brown eyes that sparkled with a special light when she smiled, brought light into my life. Her short dark hair and sincere smile made her unique. On the way home, I was unusually silent and Katie, sensing my mood, didn't insist on talking. She knew I would open up when I was ready. At home, after the children had gone to bed, I looked out the window thoughtfully, pondering everything that had happened. Katie without disturbing my silence, continued her evening rituals. That evening, after meeting with Marilyn, I decided to share with Katie without any prelude. I met Marilyn, I said directly. Katie, peering out of the bathroom, asked about the reasons for our meeting. I explained it was for business, but under the influence of a few beers, the conversation turned particularly candid. Katie expressed doubt about the meeting being coincidental and suggested that Marilyn was looking for a reason to see me. How much did you drink? She asked. Four, I honestly replied, admitting it was emotionally draining but necessary. Katie supported me, saying it might have been necessary, giving me a comforting smile. When Katie gracefully crossed the room, turning off the bright overhead light and leaving only the warm light of the night lamp, she undoubtedly drew attention. Passing by, she casually touched herself through the silky nightgown I adored. This gown, barely covering her, highlighted every line of her figure, especially accentuating her enchanting chest. Her eyes sparkled and her smile, illuminated by pearly white teeth, instantly overshadowed everything around. With that very smile that I couldn't look away from since our first meeting, she easily climbed onto the bed and settled comfortably between my legs. Just relax and let me take care of you, she whispered, as if offering a cure for all woes. At that moment, when I felt most secure, a vision of Marilyn suddenly appeared before me, reminding me of the night that changed everything. My trustfulness, with which I entered into marriage with Marilyn despite her scandalous past, suddenly seemed foolish to me. All the warnings I ignored only reached me when I came home early one day and discovered her infidelity. I always believed that our love could overcome anything, but that night proved it otherwise. At the beginning of my acquaintance with Kathy, unable to cope with the disappointment, I unconsciously transferred my feelings onto her. However, this time, looking into her face, I couldn't hold back the tears. Tears that a man doesn't shed since I left the woman who was once my whole world. Shame mixed with the realization that although Marilyn might have been my first true love, in reality, my heart belongs to Kathy, a woman who turned out to be much better. I realized my mistake, having lost many years ago what I might not have had at all. With these thoughts, I hugged Kathy tighter and kissed her as if for the first time, confessing my love. I love you, Kathy, I said, sincerely grateful for her endless patience and understanding. I remembered everything that was between us when I saw her again, and we talked. Forgive me for the outbursts of anger. You didn't deserve that, I began, but Kathy interrupted. What you said when we were getting closer. I understand that I can't erase Marilyn from your heart, but I believe there's also a place for me in it. Her words touched me deeply. She left a wound in my heart. I don't want her to be part of it, I managed to say. You're the one I chose. You deserve all my love, not just a piece of it. Jason, you can't change the past. You loved her, and she gave you a wonderful daughter. That should also have a place in your heart, Kathy insisted. That's one of the reasons I love you. Your ability to love without limits. We have a future ahead of us that I cherish. But you can't just forget the past. I love you very much. She finished and feeling sleep take over me, I only whispered in response. Kathy turned off the light and hugged me, sending me into a deep sleep for four years. An hour has passed since that night I last saw Marilyn.
Jamie is getting married to a wonderful guy she met in college. He's crazy about her, and she about him. She works as a psychologist, and he's studying to be a nurse. Don't laugh. It's important, I think. They live nearby, in the city where Kathy and I have been attending a large Catholic church since our marriage. I sit alone in the church, holding a letter from Marilyn, pondering whether to pass it on to my daughter. What could Marilyn possibly say to the daughter she left so long ago? What words could comfort a heart that has yearned for its mother for so many years? Unfortunately, Marilyn will no longer be able to say this in person. Two years ago, her life was cut short in a motel room, becoming a victim of violence. I went to the funeral, but Jamie categorically refused to go with me. In that moment, I realized the full depth of animosity she harbored due to Marilyn's actions. Thanks to professional help and Kathy's support, Jamie was able to overcome much of her grief. The question remained how she would react to the final message from the woman who had caused us so much pain. I decided that Marilyn, despite everything, remained Jamie's mother and was trying to make amends. This was my small gesture towards the woman who first captured my heart, despite all that had happened. Dear, can we talk in private? I asked, entering the chaos of the room where Jamie, her bridesmaids, and stepmother were bustling about, awaiting the wedding. Of course, Dad. What's happened? Jamie approached me, leaving the bustle behind her. Your mother, Marilyn, asked me to give you this letter before your wedding. I handed her the letter. Please read it without bias for me. If looks could kill, I wouldn't have survived after mentioning her mother. But as she read the letter, Jamie's facial expression changed. There appeared that playful kindness and confidence I so loved. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she finished reading. She really did love me, didn't she? She asked. Yes, in her own way, I replied, offering her a handkerchief. We entered the room where the guests had gathered, as father and daughter who had experienced a significant moment. She was so foolish, Jamie said. Yes, but I was no better. Knew what I was getting into and still married her, I confessed. She carefully folded the letter, hid it in her dress so it would be close to her heart. Let's go, Dad. My real mom is here, and we need her help now. I realized that I had made a mistake that still troubled me to this day, but thanks to a second chance and love for a woman who deserved it, I found happiness again. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But not this time. That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!